Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, one and all. Thanks for joining us in this episode of LinkedIn Live with Suresh GP. Uh, this is the LinkedIn Live of Top Solutions, which we present almost every two weeks to share about a very interesting topic or a theme that would benefit all our um, customers, partners, friends, and colleagues. It's one way of giving back to the community. So if you have just joined us as part of the LinkedIn Live today, please put it on the comment section of where are you dialing from, because we have regular visitors come over all over the place, and we would be delighted to see you all attend this important session of LinkedIn Live. So what are we going to present is on a, a very important topic that is uh, close to our heart, and that is uh, on customer success and experience management. I'll come to our guests first. Um, our guest for today is Anthony R, who is who has got over uh, 40 years of experience um, working in various IT strategy, managerial, consulting, executive, organizational positions in over 50 countries and has enabled a lot of service management goals to be achieved. Um, he's currently the innovation and strategy advisor for CDW at ServiceNow Solutions. And he joins us all the way from Houston. So we're going to talk about a very important topic called customer success and experience management. Uh, if you have been in the world of service management, we have evolved over a period of time. We're going to focus on these following agenda items. Defining the whole customer experience in the digital age. Why does customer experience matter? How do you compare and contrast customer experience and customer success? Why should organizations be thinking about to improve customer value? And some of the real world experience of industry trends and experience sharing that we would want to uh, share with you. Because if you think about uh, Anthony's experience over 40 years, you can think about there's a whole lot of things happening around. So with no further ado, I want to welcome Anthony to our stage today. And hello, everyone. Looking forward to uh, really presenting this uh, uh, the content here. And uh, the, even before I start, I hope everybody, if you're just starting your day, you have a wonderful day. And if you're ending your day, you had a wonderful day. Because at the end of the day, that's an important experience for you personally to have, just, just to be successful in your day. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Anthony. And, and you did mention about the value and customer experience. So one of the things that we are committed for this session, as we were talking about, is to give enough amount of value to people who are attending this session. They're going to spend one hour with us, and we know time is money. So we wanted to give enough amount of takeaways for people who are attending the session. So if you're joining in live, we would like to know what are your questions. And do not forget to even share your own personal experiences, because um, I always believe that it's a, a crowdsourcing that's happening around. It's a collective wisdom that you're going to kind of focus on. Um, so I'll kind of hand it over to Anthony to kind of kick, kick us off on this whole journey of customer success. But let us let me start with one important part. Why was this topic very important? I know, which is very close to your heart. Over 40 years, you've been talking about in different facets of roles and responsibilities that you've gone at. So give us a little bit of a sense of why you wanted to talk about this topic, and then we can deep dive into it. Yeah, I think uh, the reason I want to talk about this topic because it's emerging in the industry today. A lot of organizations are trying to improve the overall customer experience, which is different than just managing SLAs and OLAs and stuff like that within the organization. But at the end of the day, one of the things we've been talking about in the industry always is that even I think Peter Drucker said, there's no organization should exist unless it delivers social value at the end of the day. So how do you really get there? You know, that's really about the, helping the customer be successful, the organization be successful, and then really connecting all the pieces together. Another thing, uh, you know, as it relates to ITSM, sometimes as ITSM practitioners, we get stuck in the operational aspects of our job, and we forget the real reason why we're there, which is really to support a customer. No customer, no need for us. So we got to make sure that we don't create technical debt. We do the right things for the organization, the employees, and at the end of the day, the overall customer. So that's why I really want to get across you know, my experiences related to this and trying to uh, take customers on journey so that they are more successful 
but actually deliver more value to the business and their customers versus just doing IT projects that may, you know, not uh, deliver the value at all. Sometimes I call those IT projects hobbies. I say sometimes <laughs> we just have a lot of hobbies, you know, that we just feel passionate about, but we really need to connect the pieces together to the overall goals, vision, and mission of the organization at, at the end of the day. So that's that's, that's why. <laughs> That's great that you said about hobbies on the expense of the business. So if you're an IT, you probably show up something very important because um, I tell people that um, within business and IT, can business outsource IT or IT outsource business? In most cases, it is business outsourcing IT. So if IT does not deliver consistent value um, and value keeps on changing over a period of time, mm -hmm. uh, we will talk a little bit about it, then we get outsourced. So we are on the verge of listening to your uh, conversations, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you to take this and run us through this journey. Okay, let's, let's uh, use the slides to sort of structure our conversation. Of course, you already talked about this. This is just the agenda for today, uh, defining customer experience in the digital age. What does this mean? Some of the listeners may not be uh, uh, privy to what's going on in the industry related to customer experience. They still may be uh, caught in the SLA journeys and, and things like that. So we're going to talk about that some. Why does customer experience matter? Of course, if you just think about this on a personal perspective, of course, my experience as a customer matters. One of the things we always said in, in ITSM as it relates to the service desk, if a customer or user contacts the service desk and has a bad experience, no matter how good the product is or how good the service is, more than likely they're going to look for an alternative. You know, they're going to say, oh, that experience is terrible and no way I'm going to continue using that product. There has to be a product that's similar that I can get a better experience, better support, better delivery of the product and, and, and everything else. A lot of us have experienced that. I've experienced it, you know, during my journey as a customer and, you know, and so forth. So it does matter. So we'll talk about that a little bit more and put some more context and metrics around it. Then comparing, you know, customer experience and customer success, you know, just because you have a good experience, don't mean the customer is successful from a customer perspective or from the organization's perspective. So we want to understand that a little bit more. Sometimes customer success is buried within customer experience or SLAs and so forth, but we really know that's not true. That just right. because we meet an SLA doesn't mean the customer is uh, successful. Just because they have a good experience, like I said before, doesn't mean the customer is successful either. Then what should you think about to improve overall customer value? Because remember, like I said earlier, the reason why we're here at the end of the day is to support customers. No customer, no need for us at the end of the day. So we got to make sure, even if we're in a profit or nonprofit organization, still no customers, no need for us. So we have to make sure that we add value all the time, improve that value, improve the experience, and improve the success of those customers. Awesome. Okay. That's, a, that's a mail from, that's a message from Shyam Venkat is joining from uh, Dallas. So it's great to see uh, Shyam talk about that uh, as well. So fantastic insight to start. No organization can exist if they cannot deliver social value. Thanks for joining, Shyam. I hope if you're joining us, please tell us from where you are dialing in so that we know our questions. So, yeah, go ahead, uh, Anthony. Yeah, but, but some organizations do exist without delivering social value, but over time, they right. start to dissipate. They start to disappear because we sure. realize those things are not good for us, you know? Absolutely. Okay, let's go to, to the next slide. So when I put this together, I said, what is customer experience in the digital age? So here's an easy definition. It's the practice of designing, implementing, optimizing interactions Keyword interactions between a business and its customers across the customer journey. So we're going to talk about customer journey mapping and a few other things so we can understand what this really is. So some of the key elements when we think about customer experience, understand the customer's need. Obvious. We have to understand customer's needs. But like I said earlier, sometimes we don't pay attention. We get into our IT bubble and we think we understand what the customer's needs. We start developing stuff and everything else. Then we find out that some of the stuff we develop, customers don't even know about it. So if you ever had a service catalog type uh, initiative and you went and verified your service catalog, say, hey, let me go to the customer and verify the, the services I have in my catalog. I and mean, you may do this, say, here's service number one, capability number one. Hey, customer, do you use this? Oh, that's great. Wonderful. What about capability number two? Oh, I didn't even know you all did that. And we experienced this today, like with the products like iPhone. 
no way I know all the capabilities within my iPhone and so forth. So if I don't know it, you know, I I can't get value from it and, and utilize those type of things. But from an IT perspective, we do those type of things all the time. Customer journey mapping, we're going to talk about that. What is a customer journey? This is almost, as I talk about this later, related to how we've been thinking in the industry about being lean. You know, so if you know lean practices and you look at the customer journey mapping, you say, oh, there's some similarities here. And really the similarities in everything we go across all the best practices and everything else. Uh, journeys or the experience should be personalized and customized, but there's also a gold, what I call a golden standard related to experience. But as you start looking at this, you're like, man, I can probably make this more personal so that the customer thinks that they're not my only customer at the end of the day. It should be seamless, consistent. And then one of the other key factors is employee engagement. Because we also say if employees are not happy, customers are not happy. You know, we're starting to connect these pieces together. So we're focusing on, you know, customer uh, employee experience just as much as customer experience and making sure our employees have a good experience. And when that happens, they become not just compliant to the activities, but more compassionate about the activities and wanting the organization to be successful at the end of the day. Feedback, of course, we've been talking about this forever. We have to get feedback on the things that we do and 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 and, and measure things. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but decision support, but decision support itself at the end of the day has sort of two facets, you know, and I've worked with a lot of organizations on this. It's the experience that people have and it's the metrics or data. Sometimes we just use experience, but we don't use the data. And we say, oh, that, um, you know, Anthony Smart, he knows everything, but if I don't have the right data to back me up, the decisions may not be as, as valuable as I want. And then technology and automation becomes important. But for customer experience, sometimes what we'll find out later, you don't have to invest not one penny in, in technology to improve the customer experience. Okay. So, and then there's this aspect that I talk about a lot because of the way that we are, the people that we are, that we have, you know, uh, ways of what we think about stuff. We think about things from an analytical perspective, which is conscious perspective. And we'd also relate things to a subconscious perspective, you know, the, the behaviors and things that we have seen in the past, you know, and this is what we use most of the time. There's even it's books on this. One of them that I call is called fast thinking and slow thinking, you know, because that book is just amazing. There's a college class on it. And what's, what's fast thinking, fast thinking is uh, subconscious thinking. Slow thinking is analytical conscious thinking. So we have to understand how customers uh, use this because one of the things that you, you, you'll find out if you look into this more, that subconscious thinking, people lose track of time. Time doesn't matter anymore. So if somebody's having an experience and they say, man, this is taking too long, whatever, you can influence that experience by engaging subconscious thoughts within that person. And we could talk about that in more detail too, maybe. And again, always continuous improvement. I was just talking earlier, uh, and we were talking about, to, we go through continuous improvement. I don't know everything. I'm always improved. So the people on this call, please give us feedback. Please tell us what you're thinking and everything else. Not only it, it, it improves your knowledge, but it's going to actually improve the way we think about the subject too. Okay. Absolutely. And I think it, it resonates for me a very important topic that you talk about the employee experience or engagement. Now, many times we think about building a great customer experience. If you don't treat your employees first uh, with the same level of experience, don't expect your employees to treat your customers with that level of experience. Easy said than done, because um, a lot of times this is also between external service and internal service, right? When we say a service by definition has to deliver value and outcomes. We seem to be so much focused on external client facing things because there's a there's a money coming into the account or the dollar that is being coming in and paying out. So we pay less attention to um, internal uh, people, internal employees, because we take things for granted. So you really hit the nail on the head when you talk about the employee experience is also important because they will become your real ambassadors to showcase value. Yeah, great. So let's let's go forward and let's talk about a key element of customer experience management. And you're starting to hear about this in the industry, XLAs, experience level agreements. This is a subset of the overall practice of a customer experience management. It becomes very important because, like we just said, we want to measure, you know, what's going on and everything else. 
one of the things that you're finding out, a lot of the ITSM technologies support XLAs. They have metrics in there so that you can understand the experience that customers are having with your products and, and solutions that you're uh, you know, uh, uh, delivering to the market. So the quality of service is not just about SLA delivery and support of service. It's about how your customers feel or what we call sentiment analysis. You know, what do they feel? Do they have a good experience? And, you know, if you take this personally, you say, yep, I get it. You know, because sometimes, you know, just like I said earlier, I may contact the service desk and they do something or whatever, but I don't get a good feeling. You know, so I really don't want to do business with you. Even on a personal level, if I don't get a good feeling about you, I mean, I want to socialize with you. And that social aspect is the same thing related to dealing with an organization and a customer. You can use sentiment analysis models to predict, you know, behavior. That's what we want to get to. We don't always want to react, but we want to be predictive in the way that we're managing our XLAs and setting expectations and so forth as we go forward. You know, there's a lot of information on the web today about XLAs that you should go out and look and do research on and get a lot of more uh, insight to what these look like and what they feel like. And even if you're using a particular ITSM solution, go back to your vendor and say, where are the metrics for the XLAs that we may want to put in place so that we can you know, uh, capture those things within our organization? Yeah, so for people who just joined, if you have any questions, comments as we go through it, please put it on the comment section because we want to get live feedback from the, from the audience because you might have the same problems facing in organizations because uh, we have been running IT service management for a long period of time. And your customers are also expecting more uh, beyond just the contractual obligations. So um, how many of you here are already following XLA? I'm just throwing a poll, right? Uh, have you started in your own respective organization, Sham and others who have joined here um, to measure the sentiment analysis, for example, or um, the XLA for this? Is it formally... Uh, started to be practiced in your organizations. Please put that as well as we go through this. Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. Yep. Please give us feedback. Let us know what you're thinking and, and everything else. So that other aspect I was talking about customer journey mapping. Now, what what is it? It's a representation of steps and touch points that a customer goes through when act, interacting with a product or service. What do they do first, second, and third? And we we've done this with other things as we do process design and other architectural designs and everything else. So now you're architecting what the customer goes through. What is the experience like? And you're putting it in definitive you know, uh, activities and, and so forth, and you're gathering the data. And, and so then I told you also, I said, as you do this, you can apply sort of lean thinking to this. Can I, we improve the customer journey? Can we you know, uh, decrease the time? Or even from uh, the perspective I was talking about, from a subconscious perspective, as the customer goes through a journey, if I sort of create a new experience, I won't say distract, but create a new experience as they go through the journey, they lose track of time. For example, it may be something that's a man, it takes 30 minutes to do this. But once they engage at the subconscious level, then we go, oh man, I, I don't know how long that took. Did it take five minutes or 10 minutes? You can adequate this to maybe watching a good program, a good movie. I remember I was watching um, one of the Avengers movies. It was three hours long. I'm like, wow, I'm so into it because I like that stuff. And I was like, man, that didn't feel like three hours. That felt like 20 or 30 minutes the movie was on because I was having such a great experience that the time didn't matter anymore. So if time becomes a factor within the journey map and as you get feedback from your customers, there's ways that you can do this and, 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 and manage to it without actually changing the technology by giving them a subconscious, you know, experience. So and as you I, look I, at this, yeah, go I'm ahead. Real, I, and I was just reminded about this one. I just wanted to uh, talk about that. Um, Disney World as an experience. I know a lot of people go to that every year. And I was just asking curiously with one of the uh, of customers, why do you go to Disney World every every year? I mean, we have been speaking in service management world and you look at Orlando, most people come for the content, but they also go for Disney World as an experience. And the same thing, they go again and again because subconsciously, 
they had a great experience and they want to relive the same experience around it. So it's very true. How do you kind of influence people at a subconscious level? Because you've consistently delivered that wow factor and aha moments throughout that life cycle. So that's a very powerful way to look at things. Yeah, and, and let me tell you a little about Disney too, because I, I looked at them before. They want all their customers, all their clients to come in and have a good experience. Right. You said good experience versus a great experience? Well, the experience, you no, know, it's always continuously trying to be great. But what they mean by good is consistent. So as you go through the Disney experience, you have a consistent experience. So that you cannot say that one activity was really better than the other one, or you got exceptional service over here, but not here. But now that it's a negativity to that and a contrast. You know, they want you no. Know, so if you went to Disney, oh, what's so great about it? Or what? Well, I can't put my finger on anything. Everything was just good. You know, at the right. end of the day, that's the experience they want the, the people to come to the park to have. So that you just can't point to anything. So they make sure they train the people, the employees have a good experience and everything else like we were just talking about. So as you do customer journey mapping, they sort of get back to the slide, identify customer personas. Now, this is very, very interesting, you know, because there's different personas as we call the gen generation and so forth. Each persona has a different perspective on the experience that they want to have. And so you have to understand that. And we know this based on me versus my kids, you know, what they consider a good experience and, and, and so forth. The experiences that they have that they're willing to pay for. I'm like, oh, no, I ain't paying all that money for that. But they'll, they'll spend their last check on it. You know, I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, you know, uh -uh, not for me. So we have to understand that, you know, as relates to, as we map out this journey, who are we really targeting with this journey to find out the touch points? Gather the data, very important, the insights, the insights you actually get from the customers themselves. And you have personal experiences that you should put in there. Create a visual representation, you know, and as you do this, now you sort of have a map. And then anytime you visualize something, visualization helps with improving performance and creating higher performing activities and so forth. So once that visualization happens, you like you have aha moments and everything else. Think also related to like. When you think about project management, what's quality? Well, it's based on time, scope, cost, and other things that we need to sort of segregate, but also put together as it relates to how do we define quality? You know, validate with the customers, the users, and employees say, is this what you experience? Is this what's happening? So don't guess, don't just say, oh, I'm the expert and I know it all, and I know what they're feeling and everything else, just like in a personal relationship. You can say, oh, I know what she's feeling or he's feeling. No, you have to ask them. Then you create rapport. Then you create the trust so that you're going to help with the journey and everything else. Identify the opportunities. And like I said before, it's not always a technical solution that you have to put in place. It's not always something that you have to spend a whole lot of money on in order to improve the customer experience through understanding the journey that they're going on. So there's a one question, um, um, Anthony, from Shyam. A big area and an opportunity in the industry is to boost the experience for voice-based customer support. Many times the call goes through endless loops, which at times makes the customer think if it is built to avoid the customer connect, you know, uh, press one for this, press two for this, I'm waiting to press nine. With so much technology, things should get simplified. Um, so sometimes support at times is frustrating. So a lot of, do you think a lot of needs to be happening to improve the area of chatbots and AI? Because you're still in the initial phase of leveraging some of those elements. Yep, I, I see this, I experience it myself, and I'm, I'm like, wow, and I said, we can do a lot better. I say, sometimes I, what I see with solutions like this, we say, we may uh, come up to a requirement, say, hey, we need a, 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 a chat box, we need an IVR, we need an automatic call distribution system, and, and, and so forth. And we throw it over the fence, and then we put in basic things without really going through activities like this. Say, what's the experience like? What should the experience be like when somebody calls you know, to the service desk and, and, and everything else? How do I want to experience that? How do my customers want to experience it? And I have to really understand that. And at the same time, you know, what becomes even more important, I think a lot of organizations, sometimes they get a little lazy because they don't have the budget to actually fulfill everything that they have, but they have to justify the ROI and the total cost of ownership of doing things right there related to the other things that we're going to talk about when we actually get to defining customer success. 
when we get to the customer success metrics that I bring in, think about those metrics related to using that technology for the experience that the customers want to have. So you have to really connect all the pieces together, really understand what is the cost of operating your service desk from the right perspective and is it worth it, you know, from a total cost of ownership, return on investment perspective, and what I call VOI perspective, value of investment perspective related to current customer needs and long-term organizational needs and, and so forth. So we got to make sure that we do the right things there. So we just really, at the end of the day, as we get to the end of this presentation, it's about connecting those pieces together so that we do the right things. So a great question. Thanks for that. Okay, next slide. So this sort of gets to, you know, a contrasting customer success and customer experience. So on the le your left hand side, I've created a model. And what I want to do with this model is give you a perspective on how sort of this stuff connects together so that you don't look at it in silos. So at the top, of course, we talked about experience management. Well, one of the other things I used to talk about, I've been talking about this for, for a long time. I actually presented on experience and engagement management at a ITSM conference in Australia, I think it's seven years ago, you know, and I told them at my presentation, I said, the missing processes or practice areas within ITIL that you need to be concerned about. And I talked about these two and a couple of more specifically. But I thought this was very, very important back then and it's, and it's emerging now, be important today. So if you look at the model, it says, I said, sort of at the top, experience, engagement, you know, and what we've been talking about with engagement to go a little bit farther with that is omni-channel, you know, so that we have all the capabilities on, the, on all the same channels, but it doesn't have to be that way. It has to be customer focused on what they need on those channels and the experience they want to have. Just like when we were talking about Chad and IBR, that's an engagement channel. So what should be the experience related to those channels? So we have to connect the pieces together there and not just clump them all things together. And underpinning that is what we do, you know, service management, the services and the products that we deliver, our portfolio of services. So we have to make sure we connect those things the right way. Base, make sure that the consumption of those services and those products are done from a customer perspective, you know. So then we have disciplines like IT service management and product management, especially if you're a DevOps person, you talk about products more than services. And I always say services become before products, but that's me. And underneath that to be compliant, we have our SLAs, our OLAs, our organization structure, the people, the employee success and everything else that supports what we're really trying to do from an organizational perspective. And if you just look at the bullets, XLAs are supported by SLAs. They're not separate. SLAs are supported by OLAs and underpinning contracts. They're not separate, they're connected. And it's all about operational efficiency and doing the right things and so forth. And it's, it, you know, we have to streamline our process, we reduce wait time, personalize the service, all those other things that you see there. But at the end of the day, what we really have to do is not look at these things in silos. Matter of fact, the organization as a team should be working together on these. That's why, you know, initiatives like service management office start coming to play. You know, even if you think about it related to some older uh, ways of thinking like ERP, the reason why ERP start to exist because they need to bring the organization together to think about things in a like fashion so they can make the good decisions. The IT at service management people and the DevOps people have to come together. That's a paper I wrote a while back, synergies between ITSM and DevOps to talk about those type of things that they have to come together to work together as a team for what? Customer success, for customer value, which is gonna to lead to organizational value, okay? I think it's a great point that you say about this model where you're talking about they are all connected to each other. So I call this SLA as more like a hygiene factor right, where you have to have that, but just because you have your SLAs doesn't mean that your customer is happy, but you need to build it something on top of it. I mean, we have something like XLA, the sentiment analysis. In SRE, we talk about service level objectives going beyond, over and beyond your contractual obligations, because mm -hmm. this is the bare minimum that you are expected to deliver. Okay, now what, what next? You know, how can you push yourself beyond what you're delivering today to the, to the next way of doing it? But also this problem, and you mentioned it very clearly, they're all done by different teams, Anthony. So who is going to tie this whole knot of end-to-end -end value chain? Is that a custodian 
uh, from your perspective, who's look at the entire customer experience journey, like the customer experience and engagement management, who typically drives this as an organization-wide initiative? I think uh, it's a, a construct that we talked about a long time ago that needs to be brought back up again, which is the service management office. If you just even think about the managing services, you know, at the end of the day, underneath that umbrella should be these entities that work together to deliver right. what we're trying to do from a customer success and experience perspective. That becomes very important. Sometimes organizations, they create what's called COE, Center for Excellence, but then right. sometimes they work in silos, but the Center of Excellence should support the service management office, just like the PMO should support the service management office and not lead the service management. Mm -hmm. So you really need some leaders that are accountable and responsible for these type of things within the organization so that you could create that teamwork, that cohesiveness between what you're actually doing within the organization. And the ITSM, one of the things we talked about a long time ago, we said they need to be process owners. Process owners work with service owners, but sometimes organizations don't have service owners. They have right. IT application owners, which they call service owners, but those are not service owners because they don't understand the concept of IT services and business services. In order to do that, you really need to go through an exercise and do service modeling and understand, right. oh, these are the services I deliver. These are underpinning IT services and underpinning IT services are these other things that brings together the whole organization from an architectural perspective. So I can see it and I can manage it and I can understand even things like we talked about for a long time, 20% of the business brings 80% of the revenues. So we can manage to those type of things more appropriately with our strategic assets within the organization. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So let's go a little bit farther. So what did I do next? I said, uh, you know what? I just talked about customer experience, but throughout this whole session, I've been telling you about customer success. So how does customer success fit into what we're doing? So here's customer success at the top, which is to me right now in our current environment is the ultimate goal for our customers to be successful. You know, what does that mean? And I, 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 I talked to people about this. I said, you know, if you ever watch Shark Tank and you listen to the questions that they bring up, one of the questions they ask, you know, What's your churn rate? They may have just tasted a great product or whatever. Say, man, this is cool. So, so who are your customers? How, what's the customer acquisition cost? What's all this stuff? They get really customer focused. They say, what? You have a return rate and you have no customers coming back for your service? Uh, I don't know if I want to invest in this. It's just me a, a one hit wonder or something like that. And it's not, you know, a growth industry and, 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 and so forth. So they talk about these things. So right. some of the key metrics that come out of this is like, customer lifetime value, you know, is this customer staying? And we know how this works sometimes with brand awareness. You have a great brand, your customer lifetime value just increases overall. So a lot of organizations try to brand their solutions and everything else so that, that that's the one I want. You know, I, I have parents and friends and you know, they go to the grocery store and they will only buy a certain brand, even though if they look at the generic and it has the same stuff, eh -eh. I want this brand because I trust it, I believe in it, and it has a value to me for being successful. Customer health score, combination of multiple things, customer product usage and adoption patterns. We have to look at this, churn rate, referrals, and, and then last but not least, ZMOT. A lot of people don't know what this is, but that stands for zero moment of truth. So what happens before a customer actually becomes a customer today? They go to social media, they talk to their friends and everything else. They look up stuff on the internet. Then finally they go, man, it seems like people are having a real good experience with this company, with this product and everything else. So they get in what's called a zero moment of truth before they actually get into the product and everything else. So we have to pay attention to that if we really want customer success, which a lot of organizations do, but they do it separately. They do it from a marketing perspective sometimes because they just focus on the marketing and they're not connecting the pieces together and like they should and, and so forth. So if you look at the model and you say customer success is the ultimate journey, well, experience is important. Understanding our services are important. Understanding the products, understanding the SLAs, you know, for support and delivery of services and the OLAs that support that and how the organization structures, you know, as a team to actually deliver on those promises that we are actually trying to elevate to customer success and get rid of the hobbies, get rid of things that really don't have any value. But at the end of the day, 
really focus on customer value because again, I say this at the end of the day, why are we here? No customers, no need for me, you know, <laughs> no need for Absolutely. us. You know? and, and, and also sometimes the feedback, a lot of times, let's talk a little bit about feedback. Some of the times we look at a customer satisfaction score in, in our experience, there's only 30% of people who fill the customer satisfaction service. So what happens to the remaining 70%? So I asked this question, I was in a, in a uh, board meeting and uh, the, the CIO was presenting their SLA targets for the QBR. And he was saying that we had a 99.99% availability and our customer satisfaction score is great. And everybody gives a thunderous applause. And the CEO said, sorry, I need to barge in. Um, last quarter, we lost 11% customers. And there's a pin drop silence in this whole episode. Then I was asking, is the CIO or IT director saying something um, wrong or they were measuring the, the wrong indicator? So to your point, a lot of times it's not just about the measurement is just one part of the equation. There's a lot of things that is not coming to the surface. It is behind the scenes because I don't want to reveal a bad experience because I know in front of Anthony, I'll say that, yeah, he's a great guy. He's, he's doing that. But probably I, I hate something which I can see. Is that is that what you see also when you see some of the feedback and surveys that comes with customers and what's been your experience? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that you said there. But I think the other part, you know, the way I feel about customer set, you know, and, and giving that data, I look at it and say, yeah, right. They're going to do something with it. It's going in a black hole. They're collecting stuff. And it's a part of the big collective. And my my voice really doesn't matter. So what becomes important is the feedback. Tell me my voice matters. Tell me you listen to me and everything else. Create that two-way communication when you do customer sat scores and stuff. Show me some actions happening. Say, right. hey, we got this feedback and this is what we're going to do that, and, and everything else. Let me know you're going in the right direction. Don't just put it in a black hole at the end of the day. So that 11% you know, churn that you're talking about is those customers that probably feel they weren't heard. You really didn't pay attention to them. You don't care about the experience. At the end of the day, even though I may have gave you feedback for the last you know, uh, couple of cycles or whatever, you're not listening. You know, So we have to make sure, and that's a big part of the beginning of the presentation, is really listening, understanding the experience and everything else. Not just defining it, but really understand what's going on with these customers at the end of the day so that we can really do the right things you know, versus just use our expert opinions internally or, and, 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 and so forth, you know? So yeah. that's, 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 that's the point there, but that's a great story about, you know, Hey, we got all these great CSAT scores and everything else. And we're losing customers. Oh, where yeah. our customers aren't successful with our company. And, and, and you know what I've seen also in the past is that organizations that uh, sometimes get bad scores, they change the score, the, the way they score. So they get good scores, even though nothing's really improved. I'm like, huh? And they do that so they get their bonuses and feel good about what they're doing. And, and it's, it's just, you know, terrible at the end of the day. And I've seen it happen. You know, let's change the SLA so we can meet them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or, and I was know. just talking to one of the service desk person and I was talking to that and said, um, and they were on, on a Thursday afternoon in the service desk, they were playing table tennis. And I said, hey, folks, are you not solving tickets? And they said, no, we're waiting for P1 incidents. Um, we are measured by the number of P1 incidents we close. So I don't care about my P2 and P3 because that's so your, your behavior is based on what you really measure. And sometimes we measure the wrong things and your behavior also changes. So it's very important as people just make sure that your metrics drive behaviors. And if you drive saying that, oh, I need to close the tickets, I get paid for the number of tickets that I close then you're going to drive a very different experience or a service culture by that. Um, so that will be even more dangerous for us to revive um, in this era. Yeah, and just to add on to that, which is probably going to be another session that we do on later, uh, sometimes uh, organizations don't even really know what a P1 is. You yeah. know, I say, what, what's a P1? What's the emergency? No, right. they say, well, different people give different answers. I said, how do you overcome that? Well, you have to govern that. You have to create policies around that so people understand. And then you have to create compliance so that people don't say something's a P1 when it's really a P3 so that you can manage your organization better. But everybody got a different perspective on what a P1 is. 
Of course, you know, you're you going to have challenges there. And I've seen that, especially uh, uh, as it relates to VIP support. Because yeah. I've, I've been in the role of being a VIP and getting support. And one time I remember, I think I just needed a, a, a keyboard. You know, I wanted a portable keyboard for my uh, laptop. And they stopped everything to bring my keyboard. They sent somebody up to my office. Say, Anthony, what else do you need? I'm like, oh, wow, you all could have waited on this. I said, it wasn't that important. It wasn't, but you're VIP, you have VIP status. So we take care of our VIPs first. I say, versus real important P1 stuff? You gonna come up here and, and manage giving me a keyboard? No, come on now, don't do yeah. that. <laughs> you know, that's a, you know that's, so. a, that's a great point that you mentioned that um, as part of glorifying this whole thing about VIP and that's a special message that comes in, oh, we have a VIP user and stuff like that. Sometimes they don't have a common definition across. You're absolutely right. Yeah, So and, and you solve that with policies. You put in policies and help people who are the uh, governors decide what this is so they can direct the organization. We do this yeah. with other stuff, you know, industry governance and stuff like that. So we have to do that with you know, those type of things too. Again, we have to work together as a team. Yeah. So, so people who have just uh, joined or you've been listening to these conversations, let us know what questions do you have? What bothers you? I ask this question, what bothers the CIOs um, on the night, right? What makes you uh, feel that you have sleepless nights. What what kind of problems are you trying to solve? What challenges are you facing? Because this is exclusively to share real world experience of what's happening around in our in our own ecosystem that we need to be aware of. Because and 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 honestly, we need to be candid enough that we don't have all the answers. We we don't make everything the deadlines right, uh, but that's okay as long as you're open and receptive to see what I what do I need to do to improve my experience, my employee experience, as well as my customer experience, then we have something in stake. But if you become defensive, saying that, oh, you know what, I know all of the things, I've, I've applied all of those things, including voice of customer and stuff like that, I think we are missing the whole point because there's always a scope of improving provided you're willing to listen. So, so that's a very important aspect. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, next slide. So what your organizations be thinking about to improve customer value? And I've sort of been getting these messages across as we've been talking. Make it strategic for your target, target markets based on the gen types and, and everything else. Don't just make it an operational type thing. And I, I talk about this from you know, a lot of projects and initiatives that be either the strategic or the tactical or the operational. And sometimes operational projects don't connect to the tactical and strategic needs of the right. organization. So make it strategic from the beginning. Make it a part of a, your overall strategy, which means that you're going to think about how you want to invest and how you want to assign your assets and, and everything else, you know, and so forth. Related to your customer segmentation or your gen types, as we say sometimes. Understand the things that are common and understand things that needs to be different related to those target markets and everything else. Because we want to make sure we give them their view into the organization or their view into a particular experience that they should be having so that we get customer success. We get customer value over time and, and, and everything else and so forth. Think and act and architect holistically. And again, I'm talking about connecting the pieces together based on the model that I showed you. Connect customer success with customer experience, customer experience with SLAs, SLAs with OLAs and underpinning contracts and everything else. Make sure the value chain, I'll say it that way, everything is connected. So you understand you know, how these metrics influence each other and, and, and everything else. And that helps you bring the organization together, helps bring teaming together, helps bring organization structure and behavior and overall governance together and, and related with what you knew. And, and at the end of the day, I think it really helps with total cost of ownership return on investment, value of investment, and all those type of metrics that the organization is, is concerned about, all the financial things that keeps the organization running at peak condition and performing higher and, and everything else. Because all the stuff that we do really at the end of the day is about improving performance, improving performance internally and improving performance for our customers using technology, using our people skills, using our practices or processes, using how we you know, uh, connect to suppliers and, and use them and everything, the things we figure, think about co commoditizing and everything else so we can run a well or you know, organization at the end of the day. And remember so, again, 
Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, one question there. I just wanted to kind of sleep in there. Um, as you start to talk about what organizations should be thinking about value and stuff, it's a um, Sham's question is going forward, what would be the role of human interactions for customer experience in the era of technology focused machine human interactions, right? Uh, because we are talking a lot about AI coming into play, uh, generative AI coming into play. So, how is that behavior attitude of the customer agents? going to be important for uh, a seamless experience uh, if, if we put it in that way, right? Yeah, that is another great question. That gets us into the, the, the conversation about is AI going to replace our jobs? Is machine learning going to replace our jobs? At the end of the day, I look at AI, machine learning, and uh, all those emerging technologies as assistance to people. You know, so they take, help me do things faster they help me make decisions faster based on what I'm thinking. They give me great metrics and, and, and everything else. So going forward, the role of human interactions is, is, not, is not going to change from a basic perspective, but it's going to be enabled with those emerging technologies so I can even be better. And that's really the history of IT at the end of the day. If you think about it from the beginning, IT has always enabled humans to do things at a higher performing level to make better decisions faster and everything else. Even with uh, those tools, we say, well, maybe we could just put AI into place, but we still need people to make sure the AI is functioning correctly. You, you've seen the, the, probably the news about AI being biased, you know, and, and things right. like that because they're, they're designed by humans, you know, right. so we got to make sure we have a collaborative and coordinated effort in the, with, with creating those technologies and, uh, and, and, and so forth. But to me, again, just at, at the end of the day, it's all about enabling people, the most important and more valuable asset within an organization to be able to support your customers better. And our enablement is, you know, top of mind always, you know, at the end of the day. And the ability of us working together in a collaborative fashion and using the right data so we can do strategic thinking, use our experiences and the, the data that we get from those tools are just invaluable at the end of the day. And things like, you know, big data analysis and enterprise data stores come into play to even support that even more because you're going to start seeing the connection between those things and AI and machine learning and, and everything else. It's already sort of there, but you're going to even hear about it even more as it relates to how we improve service support, service delivery, and overall customer success and experience. Right. So I'm just looking at people dialing in. There are 30 live audience in, in the session that we speak. We have Shantababu Pandian from London joining us. And he says that for his organization, they are measuring mostly customer experience metric analysis. And I think you are talking about an, an aspect of it. There are people seeing this through and, and checking out how we can make that a really a workable one. Um, now, one question on that, and then we'll change gears. Um, is organizations even ready about the definition of customer value? Or we are somehow hinting towards the pseudo value of, okay, this is what we think that customer value is. I mean, are we kind of preempting some things without even going a little more deeper to understand? Because the value lies on the eye of the beholder. Uh, are we doing that due diligence, Anthony, from your experience in really defining what does customer value mean? Are we kind of hypothetically picking up a few of the quantifiable metrics and KPIs and dealing with this? Yeah, I, I think we're picking up little parts of it and different functional units within the organization. But right. as we know, you know, in order to make this a, a part of our culture, part of our strategy, we have to make somebody accountable for it. You know, so you start seeing roles emerge like customer experience manager and, and, and things like that because we know somebody has to be accountable for it. Because right. if we uh, put it in all the different functional units and we don't bring it together from, uh, again, a teaming and organizational uh, efficiency and effectiveness perspective, we're going to get those broken initiatives and, and pieces done. It may improve some things, but as we start thinking about, you know, uh, uh, creating uh, that um, uh, way of uh, really uh, connecting all the pieces together and creating that, uh, uh, getting rid of those, that word I was looking for, constraints related right. to doing this, we really have to, you know, have a focus on it. Just like uh, 
in the past, uh, the, now there's you no know, chief security officers that there really wasn't one probably 10 years ago or something. There's uh, uh, you know, all these other roles that emerge based on emerging technologies and the new decisions that we have to make to make our organizations perform better and everything else. We've always gone through you know, errors that, uh, of, of management, you know, from uh, managing IT to managing services to what we're trying to do now to manage customers' success and, and, and so forth. So we've always gone through these errors. As we go through these different errors, we improve our knowledge, we improve our capabilities, we improve the technology so that we can focus on things that matter. And that, why, why does that happen? Because at the end of the day, as customers, we always want more. We always right. want the next thing. So we have to be yeah. agile. We have to be quick and, and everything else. So uh, the, my answer to that at the end of the day, it, even though there's probably some focus in your organization, you need to make a strategic focus for somebody that make somebody accountable for it. And what I said earlier, if you're going to do something like this, I think you should bring back the concept if you don't have it in your organization of the service management office. Because at the end of the day, that's what we do. We deliver services and products. Service management can actually be service slash product management office so that you can create focus and intent about what you're doing within the industry related to experience and customer success with that, that type of uh, construct within the organization. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's spot on and think uh, you go in the right direction around it. We, we have about nine minutes to go. We have a last slide and then we'll take about questions if there's anything else, because this is the time for us to ask the right questions. So uh, people who have just... Uh, people who have got any questions, please do um, get us on board. But if you have any other slide to run through it, we will run through it and then open it up for Q&A. Yeah. Yep. So the, the last bullet, you no, know, again, uh, customer success, we have to understand churn rate and, and things like that. We have to really understand what's going on with an industry related to the markets that we serve or what we call the market spaces. And you've seen innovation related to this, you know, so we have to even use this to maybe inspire innovation within our organization to combine market spaces and, and so forth. And you've seen that in the industry, just like uh, if you just think simply about a phone. A long time ago, it was just a phone. Today, right. it's a the, the device has revolutionized the way that we think about the market. So there was a market for a phone, there was a market for a camera, there was a market for... Now they all converge into one. And that's because of Customers want to be successful with their product and the services and stuff that need to be delivered. So we have to understand those things. So uh, focusing on customer success is not just about, and it is about uh, maintaining, you know, the organization so that you can run the business or even grow the business or fix customer issues. But even from another investment perspective, even innovate the business so that you can be uh, have more viability the, in the short term and the long term as it relates to your competitors and really what your customers need at the end of the day. Awesome. Okay. So uh, we'll open it up for Q and A uh, and open. I have wanted to kind of start with what the first question is. As we start to look about the customer experience index, we are looking at the different touch points value. One of the things which resonated very much on the last slide was to talk about, and I want to just to bring this um, slide back here in a moment, um, is this one where you're trying to talk about three types of goals. So today what is happening is our focus is on just looking at run projects. Um, we focus on the tactical projects or operational projects, get it done, and we are dusted, right? We are saying, okay, we are doing this program, a hosting services, a database services, a website, and we are done, right? <clears throat> The, the innovation projects and growth objectives, we don't even have a visibility in many cases because we are operating at a very operational tactical level. So one of the things that we are seeing is that if you don't step up your game to be more strategic, as you rightly said, you don't have visibility on the innovation aspects and growth objects. So just doing what you're being asked to do, you become order takers. So how do you take a step back and say, I'm not going to play this order taker role. I don't want a transaction relationship. I want to play the longer version of the game. I want to be uh, invested in the relationship with my business partners and customers to take them into the journey. And that's a big haul, right? It's not possible for everybody to jump into the bandwagon uh, purely from a risk appetite standpoint and also believing in uh, joint success, joint customer success. So, so that's that's my viewpoint about the challenge that we are seeing is that we are still very dogmatic 
about contracts and small wins and and tick in the box so that we can get a larger part of the market share rather than just taking that extra step and pushing us beyond. Do you see that as well, Anthony, in, in, in engagements? Yeah, I, I do. I, I agree with everything that you said there. Uh, the only thing I want to add is, you know, that model that you see there, this right. actually comes from ITO version two. It's been there right. for a long time. It's called vision to measurement model. Right. Today, we sort of shortcut this and not to say anything bad about OKRs, objectives and key results, but they're, they're valuable at the end of the day. But this is more uh, holistic and more encompassing of what we're trying to do from an organization perspective. It says we have a vision for the organization. The vision is re related to you know, our customers and what we want to do for them and then the market or delivering uh, you know, uh, uh, social value and, and, and things like that. We have multiple missions within the organization that support the vision. Then under those is, is our, our overall strategy. Now we have you no know, operational strategy. We have tactical, you know, IT strategy, non-IT strategy, and, and everything else that we start putting into place. But it has to be related to what the business is trying to do. We create goals. And then the next part of goals is an investment area. So when we have a goal, we start thinking about investments. So when we invest in running the business, we sometimes take a big chunk of our budgets. We invest in growth, takes a little bit smaller chunk, and then we invest in fixes, which may be as big as running, depending on where you are with your customers. And sometimes right. things you don't need to fix. I'm telling you, some of the, the engagements I've had in the past, where I went in and uh, we thought that, you know, maybe we need to fix technology and everything else. We find out that the, the user or the customer is using the technology wrong because they didn't get trained right or didn't understand the differences based on that and the, and the old technologies. That's why things like organizational change management becomes important. You know, so you train people and get them to understanding the new way of doing things so they can be more productive and everything else. Then last, sometimes zero budget goes to innovation, which to me is just wrong. You should always spend something on innovation and everything else. Then you start connecting the critical success factors. You know, how, how are you going to meet these things? Because these objectives relate to projects. So you have projects to keep the lights on. You have projects to grow the business and everything else. So make sure your projects, again, not IT hobbies at the end of the day, but really go all the way up and support your strategy, your vision, your mission, and everything else. I used to ask uh, people sometimes, I say, you know, so why are you doing this? I say, how does this help the business? Anthony, what are you talking about? I'm doing this because I'm a DBA, I'm this and that, and I'm supposed to. I said, but what in your role, how does it help? The business. I said, what services are you supporting? And 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 so forth. And and what's the future direction? Oh, future direction. I just come in here and fight fires all the time. You know, <laughs> if there's no fires to fight, you know, uh, and I want to be the hero. And you know, so we see these type of things that distract from us really delivering the customer values that we want to deliver at the end of the day. So we have to again be, have somebody accountable for it, have the right. Uh, models and architectures in place, understand what we're doing and everything else. So uh, even a, a new CIO, a new C-level person, the first thing they do when they come to a new job is take inventory. So I right. tell people today, I say, you need to take inventory. You need you know, maybe advisory services. You need assessment. Come and take inventory to see what you are and decide what you have an operational objective, a tactical objective or strategic objective, and how you're going to meet that, create high level roadmaps, then create the detailed roadmaps based on the findings that you find out, then execute. And then at the same time, create organizational coordination, collaboration, but not just that organizational compassion through your OCM initiatives and, and so forth what, for what you're trying to do. And if you connect all these pieces together and just stop uh, thinking that, uh, uh, the way it is, it's the way it is, because it's a lot of improvement that can happen there related to, again, the topic of this uh, subject, customer success. And if our customers aren't successful, we have no future. We have no jobs, you know, and everything else. We can easily be taken over. And you've seen that in the industry with those startups, you know, startups knocking big companies out of the way because they deliver a bad experience they help customers be more successful and so forth they innovate it you know absolutely so don't miss that don't miss that part and uh i'm gonna stop talking so you get <laughs> yeah I absolutely so i think up. it's it's a great time great conversation so far anthony i can see the passion flowing through in terms of customer experience and delight so 
people who listened to the session for the last one hour, we had some absolute great questions coming all the way uh, from different parts of the globe in US, London, and and, and rest of the world. Um, so if you love this session, put a part about your experience of listening to uh, Anthony R's session on the customer success and customer experience. What I love about the final part was it's not about customer experience. Just because you have a great experience doesn't guarantee customer success. For me, that is a biggest takeaway that I want everybody to think about because we spend way too much time on creating that experience. But if it's not making the customer successful, it defeats the whole purpose. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. And um, closing and thoughts. one more thing. Anthony. Yeah. Just a shameless plug. So if you need help with this, contact you CW, have Anthony. contact me, and we will definitely help you know take you on the journey to being successful. And, and, and just being honest about it, he's got 40 years of experience going through this over and over again that I love this part that you need to have someone who's experienced enough so that you don't burn your fingers. So if you are thinking into a journey, you are skeptical about how it will turn out to be, there's no better way to reach out to Anthony R. He's quite active in social. He's quite active on LinkedIn and forums and he speaks in a lot of international conferences. So have a kind of a connect with him and see how we can help him and uh, get a better experience for everyone. So thank you everyone for your journey today. And uh, I hope this was useful from Top Solutions Knowledge Sharing. We look forward to seeing you all in our next episode of LinkedIn Live. Until then, stay, uh, stay healthy, stay happy, and make sure that you create a better experience for your employees, for your customers, and not to forget for your family as well. We were just thinking that it makes no sense to create a happy customers, but not happy family, right? So I think that you need to create happy people and they'll create happy business. With that, I'll, I'll let you all go to have the rest of the day, the rest of the night uh, to whichever time zone you are in. And it's been a real pleasure to host this session and we look forward to more such episodes as we come through in the next uh, weeks ahead. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. And uh, see you all and have a great rest of the day.